Welcome to Vermont Today. I'm your host, Terry Geralman, and my guests this month are Bram Kronischfeld and Dr. Curtis Hagen. Uh, Bram, a graduate of Cornell Law School, is a criminal prosecutor in, at the uh, Chittenden County State's Attorney's Office, a member of the Burlington uh, City Council, and has just announced his candidacy for the mayor of Burlington in the March elections. Uh, like myself, Curtis started out as an electrical engineer, and then he went back and got a PhD in philosophy, and now he's a professor of philosophy at the State University of New York in Plattsburgh. Uh, Curtis has, uh, has written uh, an article uh, in the um, International Journal of Applied Philosophy, and uh, the title is, Is Infiltration of Extremist Groups Justified? Um, it's uh, a rebuttal of an article written by um, two Harvard Law School professors, um, which is titled um, uh, Symposium on Conspiracy Theories, Conspiracy Theories, Causes, and Cures. And their article was published in the, um, the Journal of Political Philosophy um, in 2009. Um, I, I think uh, you can um, add a lot of insight to these uh, both the original article and the, the rebuttal, uh, Bram, because of your experience in trial work and as a lawyer. Um, the um, uh, Cass uh, Sunstein and Adrian Vermeule are the two uh, law professors at Harvard, and um, Sunstein is now part of the uh, Obama administration. Um, their article starts out saying, um, a poll uh, by Zogby International showed that 49% of New York City residents uh, believed that officials of the U.S. government knew in advance that attacks were planned on or around September 11, 2001, and that they consciously failed to act. That's 49% of the people in New York City, almost half. But of that, uh, that group, 36% uh, or more than half of the 49% of respondents assented to the claim that federal officials either participated in the attacks on the World Trade Center or took no action to stop them. So one third of the people in New York City believe that federal officials either participated or knew in advance. And then 16% said that it was either very likely or somewhat likely that the collapse of the Twin Towers in New York was aided by explosives secretly planted in the two buildings. So 16% of the people in New York City believe that the buildings were brought down by explosions. Um, now there was another um, uh, survey uh, among uh, Canadians in September of 2006 the poll found that 22% believed that the attacks on the United States on September 11, 2001 had nothing to do with Osama bin Laden and were actually a plot by influential Americans. And in a poll conducted in seven Muslim countries, 78% of the respondents said that they do not believe that the 9-11 attacks were carried out by Arabs. 78% uh, of the people in the Arab countries. So this is the way that um, the Harvard Law professors start off their article. And then they proceed. Um, their, their main thesis is that uh, the, um, the government should uh, infiltrate groups that are asking, all over the country we have groups that are asking for uh, a new investigation of the 9-11 attacks. 9-11, this is called the 9-11 Truth Movement. And there have been books uh, written, uh, several uh, uh, books have been written uh, asking for a new investigation. But uh, the government has refused. The, there was one investigation and that was not, uh, not immediate. It had to be, uh, it was at, uh, under pressure. The Bush administration finally agreed to an investigation. And then many people believe it was just a whitewash. If I could interject. Um, you read the, the, quota the quotation there with all the uh, statistics of what people believe. And just to be clear, um, the authors of the paper think that that is a problem, right? That is the problem that they have to deal with. Why do all of these people have this uh, skepticism about um, what the government and the media tells us happened? 
and it's a problem that we have to, they think, deal with in some way, as opposed to, um, you know, giving any credence at all to, well, you know, they believe that, maybe they have good reasons to believe that. And they claim that uh, our focus, it says, will be conspiracy theories that are false, harmful, and unjustified. Well, how do they know that uh, the theories, if there's no investigation, how do they know that the theories are unjustified? Right. And the official theory uh, uh, that Osama bin Laden uh, was responsible for the attacks, that's n no more justified, or we don't know that that's any more true than any of the others. And they provide no evidence in their article, nor do they point to, uh, you know, it'd be one thing if they said, you know, that the 9-11 Commission was the be-all be and end-all of, of, of investigations and they got to the uh, final conclusion, then at least they would be pointing to something, but they don't even point to that. They don't point to, to uh, you know, to any kind of um, uh, evidence for their assertion that um, counter-narratives about 9-11 um, are demonstrably false. Where's the demonstration? But they claim that the, uh, uh, the other theories are crippled epistemology. That's a, a, a big word. But as a professor of philosophy, you could probably explain what that means. Well, uh, David Ray Griffin does a better job uh, in, in his, he tackles that. And he wrote a, a book-long response to this, uh, to this article. Um, and uh, in that, he, he points out that the phrase crippled epistemology is really um, inapt. Um, but uh, what they mean, uh, essentially, what Sunstein and Vermeule mean, is that um, conspiracy theorists, and they say this in different ways in the paper, um, have limited and or distorted, wrong uh, views about, um, you know, the facts. Uh, the relevant facts. So that would be the crippled epistemology. They don't, they don't, they don't have um, a handle on the facts that would enable them to draw, you know, valid conclusions. The author you mentioned, David Ray Griffin, mm -hmm. he wrote a book, one of the early books, uh, Christian Faith and the Truth Behind 9/11, yeah. and um, he also came to. Uh, Burlington. He spoke at uh, UVM. I remember his uh, his talk at UVM. He was in the Ira Allen Chapel, mm -hmm. and the, the the building was full to overflowing. Uh, every single seat was full, and people were standing in the aisles. Um, he's a uh, professor of theology uh, at one of the Midwestern universities, isn't he? A professor emeritus now. Yeah, he's uh, retired. But he was uh, an active professor of theology for. Uh, yes, I think he describes himself as. Um, a philosopher of religion rather than a, a theologian, but people call him a theologian. So in the paper here it says, uh, uh, he cites other theories like um, uh, that he wants to um, discredit or that are flawed. Uh, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency was responsible for the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Uh, doctors deliberately manufactured the AIDS virus. Uh, the crash of the TWA Flight 800 was caused by a U.S. military missile. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was killed by federal agents. Now that's an interesting one because the court, you cite in your paper that a court actually determined that the federal government was involved in the killing of Martin Luther King. That's right. Uh, that was a, it was a civil case. Yeah. So the burden was lower than, than a, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, what do you call it? Um, By a preponderance? Preponderance of evidence, yeah. So, and, and strictly speaking, well, uh, you know, there's lots of, you know, the details matter. Um, the, the individual who was the defendant in that case, um, his name is Jowers, um, did not put up a defense. Um, so, I mean, that, that could be sig significant, but, but, uh, but the, um, uh, the plaintiffs made their case and the jury um, was convinced and as part of their finding of fact, uh, they did con conclude not only that Jowers uh, was involved in a conspiracy, um, 
uh, I believe the word is harm, to harm Martin Luther King uh, Jr., um, but, the, but the trial was all about the assassination. And they also found as part of their finding of fact that uh, government agencies were involved in that conspiracy as well. And then the, um, uh, the government, I, you know, it's on some, some website, a government website that I looked at, they have a, they have a response to, to the jury's finding, which is simply, I believe I have this in, in, in a footnote, or maybe it's in a footnote of my other paper, but um, the government basically just says, oh, the jury's out to lunch. You know, you know, and so one of the criticisms that Sunstein makes of um, conspiracy th theories in general is that supposedly they're self-sealing. Um, and I point out, well, if you can just if you can just say, you know, you just declare that a jury verdict doesn't count, you know, that, that there's something kind of self-sealing about that too. There's no there's no amount. I mean, what are you going uh, to do to 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 prove a case? If the the uh, government can just say, no, we don't, you know, no, and just reject whatever, whatever body, whatever conclusion uh, is reached. But even if it's only by the preponderance of the evidence in a civil case, uh, here we have two Harvard law professors that are supposed to know the law, and sure. they're they're citing it as a, a as theory which is so ridiculous it's not even worth considering. Demonstrably false is what they say. Well, I mean, where's the demonstration? We have a demonstration on the other side. Yeah, a demonstration is demonstrably <laughs> true. Yeah, well, according to that jury, well, mm -hmm. not demonstrably. I mean, there was it's by the preponderance of, of evidence. evidence. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So other uh, theories they cite here: uh, the plane crash that killed uh, Democrat Paul Wellstone was engineered by Republican politicians. Well, many people think that. And then uh, the moon landings was uh, staged and never actually occurred. It's or the de Great Depression was a result of a plot by wealthy people to reduce the wages of workers. It's interesting what they do in that list there. You know, what they do is they miss, mix and match uh, uh, or mix together uh, things like the JFK assassination, Martin Luther King assassination, you know, um, where, you know, there are legitimate questions there, um, certainly. And they mix that together with, with um, things that are, you know, have less credibility. And they try, it's kind of a guilt by association um, technique, which is very common. And I should mention, you know, and that this, there was a draft version of this paper that was a bit longer that came out, uh, that they posted online about a year in advance of this publication. Um, and in that draft version, there's an extra sentence at the end of that paragraph, which says that aliens did in fact land in Roswell, or something to that effect. And then it says, well, just kidding, or, or maybe not the last one, or something like that. But, um, but what is the function of that sentence? The function is to heap ridicule uh, on all of these um, uh, conspiracy theories, some of it which some of which might not, you know, have much hold much water, um, but other ones, you know, like, like again, like the assassinations of the of the 60s. I think, you know, you may people may 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 differ or disagree about what they think about that, but the idea that those are, you know, demonstrated to be, you know, lone gunmen and there's no questions and everything is solved, um, you know, I just I just think that's that's not founded. But the main thesis of this paper is that the government should, uh, uh, if there's a group of citizens that want to investigate or bring the issue forward politically, the government should send secret agents into these groups right. and disrupt them. Right. So the first part is the, is the problem uh, that people believe uh, conspiracy theories that the authors assert are, de are demonstrably false. And then the second thing is the solution, which is the cognitive infiltration they propose. And I, I made a copy here of the, the First Amendment to the American Constitution. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people to peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Mm. Now, if a, if a group of citizens forms a, a 9-11 truth group right. uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, petitioning the government to investigate the 9-11 attacks and they're peacefully assembled 
and but the government is going to use uh, tax money to have secret agents go into the group and disrupt the group. Right. So what do you think, Bram, as a prosecutor? Is this democracy in action? Or? Well, you know, I think there are some really interesting philosophical issues raised. I mean, you know, just because, I, I, I guess on, the, on the, you know, the truth of these things and on the truth of, of what actually happens, you know, it's hard to understand how a single conspiracy theory can sort of, uh, you know, overturn all of the evidence to the contrary. So, in other words, if there's a, if there's a consensus around a body of evidence as to what exactly happened, and I, and I think, you know, the example uh, of 9-11 is a good one, um, you know, as far as, as far as, you know, if we're, if we're talking about what exactly, what actually happened, um, you know, I think it seems pretty clear to me what actually happened based on the evidence uh, that we've seen. Now, if, and, 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 and before yeah. you cut me off, yeah. I know what you're yeah. going to say. Yeah. But so, there's not a consensus. Well, I understand <laughs> that, but you know, if you're, if, you're always going to be able to theorize a doubt about something, unless mm -hmm. you're talking about, um, you know, hyperbolic uh, knowledge, which we don't have access to, you know? So, you know, there's always going to be a question. You, if you want to work hard enough to, to, uh, to question a, consens a consensus of what actually happened in, in, in one of these uh, examples, you know, you're always going to be able to come up with something. You're always going to be able to come up with some kind of uh, theory about why the moon landing didn't happen sure. or why, uh, you know, uh, Osama bin Laden and, and Islamic terrorists didn't hijack the planes. Or, I mean, here's a, here's a question I have about the, the conspiracy theory around 9-11 is, how, how do you know what, it, what evidence, what scientific evidence would look like from a, uh, 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 an attack like that? You know, there's never been a controlled exper experiment, there never will be a controlled experiment to replicate, you know, what happened on 9-11. So to say that there's some kind of missing evidence out there that, uh, you know, that, that you'd expect to see from a real, you know, terrorist uh, hijacking a plane and crashing into the building, I don't know. I don't know how that makes any sense to me because I don't know what what are you looking at to to uh, to get that missing evidence? Like, what is it that you're that? How do you know it's missing, and what do you what do you think is missing when that has never happened before, and it's never going to happen in a controlled setting ever again? So, as far as you know, arguing about the uh, what actually happened, I would just make that comment that you're always going to be able to come up with uh, uh, if you work hard enough, you're always going to be able to question and come up with a, a, a conspiracy theory if you want. Now, on the issue of whether the government should get involved in shutting down, you know, these kinds of discussions, I mean, that's absolutely unacceptable to me. I mean, I agree with you. That's, you know, th we live in America where we do have a First Amendment and we do have the right to uh, assemble and we have the right to freedom of speech. And you know what? You can believe whatever you want in this country. You know, you can, and you can talk about it and you can discuss it and you can raise, and you should be able to raise the questions with your government and the idea that your government is going to, I mean, unless you're, you're uh, committing a crime, you're putting people in danger, uh, just the mere act of, of raising questions around things, uh, I think, is a vital component to any functioning democracy. So, uh, and I think we see that in, you know, not to, not to belabor the point with Burlington, but I think we've seen that in Burlington as well. You know, there's, when you don't have transparency, when you're not completely open and honest about what you're doing as a government, uh, you run into problems because you know there there are there are things going on at the government level, and again, I think Burlington Telecom is the best example of that. Had the business management and the decisions around the finances in Burlington Telecom been publicly disclosed and publicly discussed, we would not be in the situation we are right now. And and I wasn't on the council when all of that was was going on, so I don't know exactly what what information was going uh, where and what people were what questions people were asking, but um, had everyone been open and honest about it, you know, we'd be looking at, a, it would have been nipped in the bud, and we'd probably be looking at a, a $5 million or $6 million liability rather than a, you know, $17 million liability. Um, so even on the local level, it's true, maybe especially on the local level, and on the, on the federal level, absolutely. I think it's a, a blatant violation to, for the federal government to be disrupting um, you know, groups. Otherwise, who's gonna, who's going to determine the consensus that you, that you refer to? Um, 
is it going to be a consensus um, of the, the, the elite who decide what ideas are allowed to be discussed and, and um, theorized about? Um, or is it going to be a consensus that develops democratically through civil society? And that's, I mean, that's the, the central objection uh, to Sunstein's anti-democratic proposal. And I think you're, you're, you're right to, you know, I mean, these, there is a, you know, a stark irony here with, um, uh, you know, two um, big shot um, law professors um, to, to be so oblivious to the, the, the conflict with their proposal and the, and the very first amendment. I mean, what does freedom of speech and assembly mean? if the government can come in and try to undermine your group be just because of what you say and believe. Now, it would be different, and I acknowledge this in a footnote, it would be different if they had reasons to believe that these guys were violent in some way. That would be different. That's not what we're talking about. These people are being undermined simply because of what they believe. And this is the, um, uh, the current issue of Mother Jones. And um, in here, there's a, a, an article uh, called, um, on page 30, uh, The Informants. Has, have you both read this? I, I read it a few weeks ago, yeah. This is an example of government infiltration. Um, they, uh, they find someone who is a, an immigration uh, violation or uh, uh, has committed some crime, and so then, uh, as a, in order to get off from that uh, prosecution, the person becomes an informant and it will infiltrate groups. Or, so if you have in a group a, uh, uh, an illegal immigrant, they can suddenly be turned to, uh, to be a spy on the group. And then they'll make suggestions, as illegal suggestions. Or you may have a, an actual FBI agent in the group that will make illegal suggestions. Mm -hmm. And then if the group goes along with it, they suddenly become criminals. Right. Mm. Right, right. Um, I apologize, Terry, but um, I gotta go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it's good to have you here. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Terry. And thank you. It was great yeah, to meet you. It was nice to meet you too. And, and, and good luck, sincerely, you. on your on your election. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome back to uh, Vermont today. Uh, Bram had to leave us, uh, but my guest uh, is uh, Curtis Hagen, and uh, we're talking about the. Uh, uh, a paper written by two Harvard law professors and uh, the response that uh, Curtis wrote. Uh, Curtis is a professor of philosophy at uh, the State University of New York in Plattsburgh. And uh, uh, Curtis also wrote a letter uh, to the National Institute of Standards and Technology along with um, three other people. And uh, I'm going to read the letter here. Uh, it's written to um, uh, Director Gallagher of uh, NIST, uh, and it starts off, we are writing as signatories of the, nine, of the AE 911truth.org petition, that's the Architects and Engineers 9-11 uh, Truth Movement, and as concerned residents of Congressional District no, um, New York 23 to request essential clarification of the findings and conclusions of NIST in three quite specific areas. Congressman Bill Owens, though he does not express agreement with our own assessments, has graciously consented to facilitate this constituent's inquiry to NIST. First, in the collapse of Building 7, how do the NIST studies account for the rapid collapse at free fall speed for 2.2 seconds, directly downward through the area of maximum structural resistance. Such rapid collapse is simply not possible without all support being simultaneously removed. Furthermore, NIST's own multi-million dollar studies developed finite element structural models to illustrate the collapse, but what their models showed does not correspond to video of the actual event as shown in the video comparison. Uh, this discrepancy needs to be addressed. And then secondly, how does the NIST investigation explain the ubiquitous presence of unexploded nanoparticles of thermite 
in numerous samples of dust from the 9-11 disaster. This is an intensely engineered substance which could not have been spontaneously created from materials at hand. The dust should not contain these very significant particles and their presence needs to be explained. Um, and we reference uh, the uh, uh, following peer-reviewed article for details. Active thermitic material discovered in dust from the 9-11 World Trade Center catastrophe, uh, published in the Open Chemical Physics Journal in uh, February of 2009. Um, and thirdly, how does the NIST investigation account for the presence of iron-rich microspheres, again ubiquitous in numerous samples of World Trade Center dust. Uh, estimates uh, of the dust uh, uh, comprised of these spheres uh, have been uh, uh, are available and yet are not discussed in the NIST report. Such microspheres would logically be a result of explosive aerosolization of molten iron. Thus, it seems critical to explain the presence of these microspheres. Lacking molten iron or explosives as officially accepted components of the 9-11 disaster. Uh, and this is signed by um, Gerald Carpenter, Curtis Hagen, Jeff Dewey, and Christopher Dewey. And this letter was sent to uh, to NIST, uh, the National Institute of Standards at 100 Bureau Drive, Gaithersburg, uh, Maryland. Uh, uh, Curtis. Uh, By the way, I should mention, you know, that we had uh, help uh, from the architects and engineers uh, for 9-11 Truth um, in writing this, and, and, and the language was drafted by one of the volunteers from that group. Um, I had, we had previously had some conversations with um, the staffer at o, uh, uh, Senator, or, um, Representative Owen's office, and uh, in that exchange I had written my own letter which, which covered similar material but, but it had been in different language. And then you got a, uh, a response from this, didn't you? Um, yes, we did. We got a response to that letter. Um, and. To briefly summarize, um, I'll read just, just um, a, a bit of it. Um, <clears throat> regarding the, um, the 2.2 seconds, it was actually 2.25 seconds according to NIST, um, of a free fall of Building 7, uh, during which time it fell over 100 feet. Um, you know, and so that's what we were asking. How do you explain the free fall? And, um, Unfortunately, we, there was an ambiguity in the question. If you, if you um, look at the question that we also mentioned in there, um, that the, the, um, their account, uh, their model, their, you know, their, their graphic picture of it, of it collapsing does not, um, does not match the video evidence of it collapsing. Okay. And so, what they did in their response is they ignored the free fall. You know, they didn't answer our question about how, how do you explain the free fall, and instead simply said, um, most of the interior structure of the building had collapsed before the uh, north face uh, began to fall. And so they make it seem as though, you know, the, the, the interior of the building collapses and you've just got this facade sitting there, and then, it, and then just the facade collapses. Anyway. Uh, and then they say the timing of the collapse in the models developed by NIST agrees quite well with the video evidence of the collapse. Um, and so they just basically say, well, it agrees quite well. You know, and, um, but they don't address the free fall. So they just they essentially ignored that question. Um, it's an evasive answer. <laughs> but I thought it was significant in, in the responding to your first uh, question, they point out that the... Uh, the building fell by the penthouse and the interior falling first, and then the outside falls in. But that's what a controlled demolition really is, that the, uh, the explosives are set so that the building will fall inside on itself rather than falling and causing damage on either side of the building. Yeah, so in, in, in both their theory and in controlled demolition, it, it would be the same phenomena of, 
of uh, you know what goes first. You, you blow out the columns, um, central columns first. Um, the second uh, issue, well, the two, you know the second and third issue, they kind of lump together in the response, uh, and that involves the. Um, Unreacted nanothermite that was documented in the in the paper that you you cited there, um, and then also the iron-rich microspheres, which were discovered in abundance in the in the dust. Both of those things were discovered in the um, in the dust. Um, they say regarding the um, the the nanothermite, and and again we reference reference the paper that we're talking about. How do you explain these red-gray chips? Um, of unreacted nanothermite that have been found and documented um, in a peer-reviewed scientific paper, which we cite, how do you explain that? And their answer is um, that the evidence from photographs and video do not support the hypothesis of controlled demolition using an incendiary material, e.g. thermite. Well, again, that doesn't we're asking you, how do you explain the stuff that was found in the dust? And they say, well, from looking at video, ev photographs and video, we don't see any evidence of controlled demolition by thermite. It, it's not, not responsive. So they just ignore the fact that uh, they don't say it wasn't in the dust or it wasn't right, in the dust? Right. They ignored the study. They ignored you know, what we were talking about in the dust, and they just instead talked about photographs. Well, we're not asking about photographs. We're asking about a, a specific study that documented this, uh, these unreacted bits of nanothermite uh, in the dust. And, and then they also, uh, you know, by saying using an incendiary material, e.g. thermite, they're sort of conflating this, uh, you know, ordinary thermite with nanothermite. The stuff that was described in that paper cannot simply be equated with, um, you know, small bits of rust and aluminum, which is, because regular thermite is a very low-tech um, um, substance, you know, it's just powdered, um, essentially iron oxide, which is rust and and aluminum. But the nanothermite is high explosive, right? Well, it it, it can have that property as well, depending on how you know, the other, the way it's mixed exactly. Um, but but uh, you know the the details in the paper um, describe a, a a substance that is not merely something that can, can be reasonably understood as having just fallen together because the plane was aluminum and there was rust in the building. I mean, these are um, extremely small um, um, particles that are um, mixed in, in, a, in a uniform way and form these two-layer chips uh, with a red side and a gray side um, that are found in, in all the dust samples that have been, um, in which those have been looked for. Um, and so they, they don't respond. They don't, haven't responded to the question. Okay. I and thought it was interesting, too, that you, in your letter, you didn't say anything about uh, controlled demolition. No. No, right. But they understood that that's what you were talking right, about. Right, that implication, yeah. And how right. would they understand that unless they recognize that the uh, uh, nanothermite was an explosive. Well, and you were asking about an explosive, so they yes. they turned it around and they responded. Well, it wasn't controlled demolition, <laughs> yes. but we admit that there was an explosive in the paper in the powder. Uh, the other issue is the is the uh, the iron uh, spheres, and to mm -hmm. that they respond. Um, uh, you know, trace metals, organic compounds, and other materials in the dust um, from the vicinity of the World Trade Center disaster was um, outside the scope of NIST's investigation. So the finding of the iron-rich spheres is outside the scope of their investigation. Now my question to that is, um, how can evidence which conflicts with their theory of events, because they don't have a theory. I mean, that's why, why we're asking their question. They don't have a theory that accounts for the kinds of temperatures that could produce uh, the iron-rich spheres. At least that's the, that's, um, the objection to their theory. Um, and how can you know, evidence that conflicts with their theory in that way 
be outside the scope of their investigation. You can't just um, by fiat say that anything that conflicts with our theory is outside the scope and so we won't consider it. That's prejudicial. So anyway, so, so, so all three um, questions were, you know, um, treated in a way that was frankly not serious. Right? And I think that they are serious questions. They are serious questions and they, and they, and they, 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 they're just calling out for answers um, and the answers are not, they're not there. They're not forthcoming with answers. I don't think there are good answers to those questions. Maybe there are, but they haven't given them. Most of our viewers, I think, would think that uh, any American citizen could write to, uh, to a government agency and expect a, a, a reasonable response, especially since uh, the letter here it says, uh, uh, thank you for your, your letter of March 30. Dr. Gallagher has asked me to respond on his behalf. So the, re the response from NIST was written by William Grosshandler, mm -hmm. uh, a deputy director um, but you you wrote to uh, uh, the director Gallagher, and you had the support oh. of a, a congressman too. So, so no, well, I mean, he, the congressman doesn't su support our view. I mean, but we didn't take a view actually. He, but you're right to get a response yeah. or to write a letter he, questioning. Right, him. right. So, and I don't I don't object to who responded. I mean, if if you know they want to delegate responsibility to writing to somebody else, that's fine. In fact. De Deputy Director for Building and Fire Research, that's, that's a pretty appropriate person to respond. But if he didn't evade the question. But he well, right, if he didn't evade the question. <laughs> right, right. I mean, he's, he's somebody who should have recognized um, the import of, of uh, you know, and the, and the significance and, and, and the salient parts of the questions. I mean, what, what they did, especially with that first question, in a way that was the... the um, most devious uh, of the answers, um, because um, you know they interpret it in, a, in such a way as to ignore precisely the salient issue. Mm. Anyway, that's that was that was the answer, and so we responded, um, and we responded with a rather long. Uh, letter um, just addressing the first question, the um, the free fall and their and their answer to that, and you know and 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 we we attached um, some you know, the photographs um, of the three frames of the building falling, building seven, um, and um, and also NIST's uh, computer model, several frames of that, and 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 you can see in, in the NIST computer model. The, the building kind of contorts um, and you know bends at the top in, in various ways as it begins to fall. Well, building seven doesn't do that, you know. And so, what is what is your basis for saying it, your model agrees quite well, you know? Because that's all they say. Well, our model agrees quite well, quite well. Well, here are the pictures. Explain to me your basis for making the claim that these agree quite well. They don't, they don't look to me like they agree quite well. One is, one is contorting significantly, and the other one is collapsing straight down with no contortions. How are those in agreement? No, they aren't. They aren't. So that was the second question. And then um, we did get a response to that. Um, um, yeah, where they, you know, they, they, they don't answer again. Um, the agrees quite well referred to the time period from the start of the cascading failure of the floors surrounding column 79 to global collapse as indicated by the initial downward motion of the north face roof line, a total of 12.9 seconds. Um, uh, that's interesting. So the, the part where it agrees uh, is 12.9 is, is, is is seconds before the collapse begins. See, um, I just, just noticed this for the, for the first time, uh, referring to the time period from the start of the cascading failure of the floors, which they're hypothesizing, that's in their model, from column 79, to global collapse 
um, to global collapse as indicated by the initial downward motion of the North face. So that's the end of their, their time period that they're looking at, the beginning of the collapse. So you see what they're saying? Their, um, their model agrees with the video evidence up to the point where it's about to start collapsing. Well, how significant is that? The, the, I mean, the, the building is sitting there, sitting there, sitting there. And yes, so what they're saying is you can see this sort of penthouse thing collapse first. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that agrees. But that's not what we're asking about. We're asking about when the whole thing collapses straight down at free fall. How do you explain that? And what becomes clear in their second response is their response isn't an answer to our question. So they ignore that question. They, they ignore that question and answer a different question. And, and, and again, it should be clear enough from our question what the salient issue is. The salient issue is free fall. That 2.2 seconds, which we, we, we mention in the question, of free fall. And they won't answer it. And in fact, in the second response, they, um, they went so far as to misconstrue um, by saying um, data, collect, uh, data from the video examination were used to calculate the downward velocity of the roof line and determine that near free fall acceleration occurred for only a portion of the visible descent. So they're downplaying it. Only a portion. Yeah, only a portion, 2.2 seconds, 2.25 seconds, um, during which time it fell about eight stories. Only a portion, yes, but eight stories. Why do we have eight stories of free fall? How can you explain that? And then they also say near free fall here, near free fall, as if it's not quite free fall. But that's not what they say in the uh, final version of their own report. They admit explicitly free fall, 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, and it, they didn't um, come to that lightly. In the draft version of their report, they say that the um, Building 7 collapsed at 40% uh, at a rate 40% sl slower than free fall. That's what they said in the draft version of their report. And then uh, David Chandler, uh, who teaches physics, um, asked a question, uh, questioned them publicly on this, and, and, and said, how can, you, how can you put aside what is easily measurable, and points out that for a significant portion that um, you can measure, anybody can, looking at that video and using um, physics software, can, can measure and plot and, and see that it's very close to free fall. And then he did a, a YouTube video where he demonstrated how to do this. And it was after that that, because uh, this was in response to the draft version of their uh, final report, and so they changed the, the, their, fi their final report, and the final version of their final report, because of the pressure of David Chandler and, and other, other people, um, they admit that it did f collapse at free fall for those 2.2 seconds. Right? So even though they've now been pressured to admit it, they admit it and they walk away and pretend that it doesn't matter. And then later, in response to our question, they ignore it when, we, when we're asking about it and, and, and then try to reinsert the fudge of near free fall uh, and, and, and try to pretend that they haven't already admitted that it was free fall. Now, what, what is the significance? Maybe I should say something about the significance of free fall. Why do I keep saying free fall? Well, at free fall, that means all of the potential energy in the building is converted into kinetic energy, energy of motion. And if all of the energy goes from um, uh, potential energy to kinetic energy, that means there's no energy left to do any work, no energy to crush um, concrete or bend uh, steel or to break joints uh, or to push things out of the way. There's no energy to do anything. And this is going through eight floors of a steel, steel building, steel and concrete building. Right, so right. So you need energy to, uh, the people at home that breaking through these floors, you need energy, don't you? You need, it, you need some energy, yeah. right? There's no energy available. That's why they can't explain it. And by the way, they also took out the phrase which was in the draft report, um, that their analysis 
uh, is consistent with physical principles. I believe I've got that phrase right. They took that out. They no longer claim to be consistent with physical principles. They, not, they now claim merely to be consistent or very cleverly word it so that a particular aspect, not the free fall, but another aspect of the collapse is consistent with what they said somewhere else. Okay, so what? So if they're not using physical principles, I wonder what they're using. Maybe astrology? You think? Well, it's just a computer model. But not based on physical or scientific principles. Uh, well, they, no, they, they don't claim to be anymore. Right, mm -hmm. right. And when we ask questions, they don't have answers. Now this uh, group that you cite in your original letter here, uh, uh, Architects and Engineers 9-11 Truth, mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a group of people all over the country, isn't it? Uh, yeah. People who have degrees in architecture and, and experience as engineers. Right. right. And they've all come together and they're, uh, what's the group uh, purpose? Um, well, they're, they're pushing for a new investigation. They're pushing for a new, new investigation. investigation of the 9-11 attacks, right? Right, and, and, and I think in particular of, of the um, collapse of the buildings, because that's, that's their expertise. They don't think the official story of that um, holds water. And um, I should mention that they have come out with a new, very powerful uh, documentary called, um, uh, I think it's called 9-11 Explosive Evidence experts speak out, uh, and that just came out uh, for the anniversary of, um, 10th anniversary of 9-11. The official version isn't even out yet, but kind of a pre-release version is available on YouTube at this point, so people can Google that and, and watch. And there are 15, more than 1,500 um, people now, architects and engineers, um, who have signed their petition calling for a new investigation. And this new um, video has um, it's dozens, it seems, uh, of, of the architects and engineers um, talking about various aspects of the collapses of these, build these buildings and, their, and bringing their own you know, expertise um, into it, into their analysis of why um, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't add up. There was quite an organizational effort, though, wasn't there, to get 1,500 architects and engineers together on a thing like this. And this is, how was this done? This were, there were small groups in cities all across the country that uh, got together in people's homes and talked about it, and then finally they, they organized on a national level. Isn't that how it was done? I suppose. I can only speculate. Uh, I know that Richard Gage is the person who founded this, and uh, that he's gone around and he's made presentations. I went to, um, saw him give a presentation um, at MIT, uh, but he does that all, all over, uh, and, um, um, and he's an architect, and, um, and he gives a, a good presentation. And it was kind of interesting, you know, though, um, um, the response sort of from the academy has been rather disappointing, to say the least. At the MIT um, talk that he gave. He, talk, he gave a talk at night, which was well attended, and of course I don't know who, who attended, but he gave a talk during the day which was intended um, for uh, professors, and he gave it in the um, School of Architecture uh, building, um, and I attended that as well, and um, there were a few other, I mean there were a number of other people like me who had already um, looked into this and were supportive of, of what he was saying, but um, there was only one person there who might have been a faculty. I happened to sit next to him and he, he um, held the uh, sign-in sheet for a long time and then didn't sign it. So um, uh, he may or may not have been faculty and if he was, uh, he was very um, cautious about um, um, you know, being associated uh, with, with these ideas and, and nobody else um, bothered to, sh to show up. But your letter here to NIST was written, the three other people wrote it with you, or signed on to well, it. Well, you're right. The four of us signed on to it. This was mostly written by, um, by a volunteer from, um, from Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Um, but the four of you, that's like a, a group of architects and engineers in Plattsburgh, right? No, uh, I, uh, the four of us are not 
the four of us who signed this letter are not architects or engineers. I have a degree in engineering, don't consider myself an engineer. Um, but um, no, we're just, um, you know, uh, concerned citizens as far as that letter is, is concerned. But um, we are working with, with the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth Group. What I'm trying to get at here is that uh, we did get a response from Harvard Law School. Uh, and two Harvard Law professors here wrote this 25-page uh, this uh, uh, paper advocating the infiltration of groups. Right. Uh, so here we have a group of architects and engineers, 1,500 strong. Right. They had to organize on a national level. And I, I know from uh, Burlington, Vermont uh, example that uh, there's a, a group uh, that has met here from time to time of about 10 people that, uh, and many uh, in that group have joined architects and engineers, signed on to the petitions and discuss the, uh, the evidence relating to uh, uh, the, the, the terrorist attack and formed uh, as a group, formed uh, judgments which led toward uh, signing a petition with architects and engineers. And the group here in Burlington financed uh, uh, bringing David Ray Griffin uh, uh, to uh, the University of Vermont where he gave a, a talk similar to the talk you heard at MIT. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but all these, this uh, political activity to, to bring this together required these groups, which right. now um, these two Harvard Law professors say uh, these groups are uh, uh, epistemologically flawed <laughs> and presenting obviously uh, false information and therefore they should be infiltrated, disrupted, right. and stopped. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and again, they don't give any evidence for that. Um, uh, you know, in the draft version of their paper, again, um, they actually had a comment in there where they ridiculed um, certain conspiracy theorists for their response to what they described as, um, I think it was the, the, the Pentagon releasing um, um, photo, photographs or frames of, of, of video showing Flight 77 hitting the Pentagon. Um, and they took that out of the final version. Presumably somebody let them know that the photographs that were released um, don't show a damn thing that you can, that you can, that you can make heads or tails of, right? Um, so I can only imagine that they wrote that draft and made that um, uh, you know, appeal to ridicule, not having even bothered to look at the photographs in question. I mean, that is the level of the due diligence that they've done, apparently. Now here on the, the paper uh, by these two Harvard Law professors, it says, of course, some conspiracy theories have turned out to be true. And under our definition, they do not cease to be conspiracy theories for that reason. So uh, the, uh, the Holocaust, for example, right. uh, that would have been a conspiracy theory uh, in 1942 in Germany because who would believe that the, uh, <laughs> the German government was uh, murdering its own citizens? But uh, then uh, a few years later, it turned out to be true after they lost the war. Uh, but now in uh, the footnote here, it says, uh, we bracket the interesting question of whether on consequentialist grounds, it is ever appropriate to undermine true conspiracy theories. So uh, essentially they're saying here that, uh, well, even if the theory is going to be true, maybe we should still undermine it. Right, they're leaving open that possibility, yeah. So what would they have done if they were in Germany in the 1940s? Right, right, right. If, if they had some consequentialist grounds, um, yeah. Losing right. the war, that's right. a pretty big right. consequence. Right. Right. Sure, yeah, I mean, who's, who's calculating the consequences? Yeah, consequences for who? Yeah. So essentially what they're saying is they would like to have uh, covered up the Holocaust. So. Well. <laughs> uh, what else do we have here? 
And it says further uh, on page 207, uh, pointing out that some conspiracy theories are true does not uh, show that it is rational to believe in those theories. Well, uh, is it ir irrational to believe in what's true? I don't know. Uh, yes, this is a, it's a long and detailed paper that has lots and lots of problems. Um, in fact, um, after I wrote my rebuttal, I felt like I, there was so much other material that was sort of half-written um, that I had another full paper uh, to write, <laughs> and so I wrote a second rebuttal uh, addressing other, uh, other issues, which hasn't come out yet, um, but it's, uh, it's, it should be out in the fall. You point out in your uh, rebuttal here that Cass Sunstein, now working for the Obama administration, uh, what does he do for the Obama administration? Well, he is the head of the office of, um, I, I, it's, it's similar to the Ministry of Truth. It's like the office of uh, information and regulatory affairs or something very much like that. Similar so, to the Ministry of Truth. Yeah, so yeah. the idea is that they provide the Americans with the truth that they, so they want <laughs> us to, to well, see it. Well, I don't know exactly what his office does, but it seems from the title that it's not, it's not so far removed um, from the kinds of things that he's advocating here. You have an interesting quote here. It says, uh, you're quoting from uh, their article. It says, uh, we suggest a distinctive tactic for breaking up the hardcore of extremists who supply conspiracy theories. Cognitive infiltration of extremist groups whereby government agents or their allies acting either virtually or in real space and either openly or anonymously will undermine the crippled epistemology of believers by planting doubts about the theories and stylized facts that circulate within such groups, thereby introducing beneficial cognitive diversity. Right, 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 right. Um, why isn't it beneficial cognitive diversity when alternative theories get presented? That's not, they don't want that kind of diversity, right? So they, it's not really that they're after cognitive diversity, it seems to me. They're after a certain viewpoint, right? Um, and it's not as though um, people who believe in conspiracy theor theories are ignorant of the official story, right? It's not as though they've never seen um, the news, right, and been, been um, had all the, the suggestions that the media has, has um, repeated, you know, so they've been exposed to that. Um, so it's the, it's the people who believe in conspiracy theories that have the most diverse views that they're considering. It's the people who, who insist that there's only one view who have a more impoverished set of um, possibilities that they are considered. Um, so that's, just, that's in, in a way a small point. Um, but there's, you know, for, for all of their points, there are, there are uh, rather obvious responses. They talk here about knowledge-producing institutions. Uh, it says one is not warranted in believing theories that imply that knowledge-producing institutions are as unreliable as uh, some extreme theories imply. But, but what are knowledge-producing institutions? Isn't that a propaganda machine? <laughs> Um, yes, it's not well defined. That is a really tricky issue that I'd like to, to do some, some serious work on um, in the future. Um, knowledge producing institutions, um, presumably they're thinking about NIST, um, but we've just seen that NIST has not been terribly reliable. Um, I was thinking about NBC and CBS. The oh, they're, yeah, those are more like, I would think of them as knowledge, knowledge, you got to put knowledge in quotation marks there, but knowledge propagating yeah. um, institutions. Um, I would think that more like universities and um, 
and government agencies perhaps that investigate things. Um, but, but these things are unreliable. Um, you know, does anybody doubt? Well, well the, um, you know, the Bush administration uh, had been criticized. I mean, this is, you know, not having anything to do with 9-11, but having more to do with other ways in which the Bush administration has, has politicized science. They were, um, you know, there was a petition signed by something like 30,000 scientists um, um, castigating them for their politicizing of science. I mean, so there's no question, really, that um, governments and government agencies um, and at least some so-called knowledge-producing in, um, um, institutions are not are not reliable. I mean, again, I was going to say that that uh, if you think about um, the FDA and you know various uh, regulatory agencies, um, the idea that they are not, at least to some degree. Um, captured by the industries that they are supposed to regulate. I mean, I think that's a pretty common sense consensus that, that they are. Um, and we can quibble about the degree, um, you know, how much um, would the, would, how unreliable would they have to be, you know. That's not something that there's a demonstrable answer for that would justify, uh, you know, infiltrations, uh, supposing that a demonstrable answer to such questions would justify um, infiltrations anyway, which it wouldn't, <laughs> right? So there's layers and layers in which they have uh, failed to make their case. The whole idea of uh, weapons of mass destruction in, in Iraq, yeah. wasn't that, uh, that idea produced by a knowledge-producing institution? I, I should think it would count. I mean, we'd, so in that case, we'd be talking about um, what the CIA and, and uh, intelligence agencies, and um, um, uh, I don't know the State Department, and, and yeah, I would I would I would think that, that that should count. And yet, well, what happened? So what these two Harvard law professors are saying that is, at that time, if any group of citizens. That's right tried to question that idea, they should be infiltrated and stopped. Right. That's right. Yeah. And then you just look at the beginning of their, uh, their paper where they say, uh, uh, in a poll conducted in seven Muslim countries, 78% of respondents said that they do not believe the 9-11 attacks were carried out by Arabs. 78%. Mm -hmm. That's a, doesn't that reflect uh, universities and knowledge producing institutions? <laughs> uh, so they're, what they're really saying is uh, American knowledge producing right. institutions. Western, Western yeah. knowledge producing, yeah. But if That's it's right. an Eastern That's knowledge, right. that doesn't count. That doesn't count. No, those people are crazy. Mm. No. That's right. I mean, that's what they think. Um, and I've, I've heard people make this much more explicitly, um, um, referring to, for example, um, newspaper reports and comparing the newspaper reports in, in for example, Pakistan with those in, in the West. Um, um, and that's not to say the Pakistanis are always right, you know, when they uh, attribute, um, you know, conspiratorial motives um, on the West. Um, but your point is well taken, that, th that we're still talking about um, knowledge producing institutions. So which ones do you do you, do you trust? And, and the answer is ours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why? On what, on what basis? It's, I mean, it's, 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 what is it? It's bias. And we've been told that this is not a crusade, the war on terror is not a crusade against Islam like they had back in the year 800 to the year 1000. There were, what, five crusades where Christian armies marched on Islam, and but uh, we, our government has told us, well, this is not a another crusade uh, that we're engaged in. Although we're we're at war in uh, 
in two Islamic countries and uh, thinking about a war in a third and, uh, and a fourth, Pakistan, Iran, yeah. Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, Why would they be paranoid <laughs> <laughs> about our intentions? But yeah. we're not yeah. engaged in a, in a crusade, but 78% yeah. of the people there yeah. in their uh, knowledge-producing institutions, that doesn't count for anything. No, right. And then you have here, um, you're quoting uh, a Dutch controlled demolition company. I thought I was interested. Danny uh, Joenko is Joenko, his name, yeah. Is absolutely convinced that Building 7 was professionally imploded. Yeah. That means controlled demolition. Yeah. Uh, but how, uh, how would Osama, how would the Arabs get into the building to plant explosives? Yeah, that's the thing. We should have maybe mentioned that when we're talking about Building 7, that, that um, you know, that building housed um, lots of, like, I don't remember all the, the initials, you know, the, but the CIA offices, FBI offices, Secret Services offices, those kinds of offices, lots of them. Um, if that building was brought down by controlled demolition, there had to have been an inside element to it. Um, I, I sh should mention also, I suppose, that um, the person you referenced, Danny Uenko, um, unfortunately uh, died just um, a month and a half ago or so. He um, drove his car into a tree on the way home from church. Uh, his dog survived. So um, an unfortunate uh, loss of somebody who um, um, was a significant sort of witness to the truth, you might say. I mean, he was shown videotape of the collapse of Building 7, um, and he just said, as, as I quote in there, you know, it's a controlled demolition. Are you sure? Absolutely. And, and he went on and on about how this was a professional job and so on. And they said, well, you know, this happened on 9-11. On, on and he said, the same day? You know, and he couldn't, he couldn't believe it, but, he, was, but he, he continued to be convinced that that was um, a controlled demolition. It's rather convenient how uh, government opponents in the United States end up dead. Uh, Peter Wellstone is another example. His, uh, his airplane conveniently crashes. And well, another one is uh, Barry Jennings. This guy was in Building 7. He was in Building 7 with one other person, um, after the first plane hit, he went in up to something like the 23rd floor um, and saw that everybody was gone. There was nobody there. And so he called somebody and they said, you know, get out of the building. So he tries to go out and when they got down to the sixth floor, um, there was an explosion in the building and the floor was blown out from beneath him and he was left sort of hanging. He had to pull himself up and uh, climb back up to the eighth floor, and um, he was videotaped in an interview. Um, this was maybe six or eight months or so before his death, and, um, in a, and when he spelled this all out, you know uh, uh, what happened, and he he was very clear that um, the buildings uh, were both standing, the tw towers were both standing, um, you know after the explosion in Building 7. And he says there was explosions going off all the time in, in, in Building 7. Again, before the collapse of the other uh, towers. Why are there explosions going off in Building 7 before the collapse of the, of the Twin Towers? Okay. So then uh, he, 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 gives this in, he gives this interview, um, this interview I was just discussing was with um, the um, directors of Loose Change. And they were going to put it in their, their at that time, upcoming, a new version of the movie. And um, uh, he calls them and says, basically, please don't, you know, I'm getting a lot of heat or something like that. Please don't, you know, include that um, interview. And so they said, okay. And then he goes off to England and he does an episode, kind of like, the, I don't remember what it was called, like a Conspiracy Files kind of episode. Uh, um, um, with the BBC on Building 7 and um, 
and he kind of makes it seem as though those the interviewers from Loose Change had mischaracterized um, what he had said because the, the real issue was he had said in the interview um, that when they got down to the lobby, finally, after the, both towers had collapsed and a, a, a firefighter had eventually rescued them and they went down to the lobby and the firefighter said, don't look down. And uh, he said, um, we were stepping over people. You can tell when you're stepping over people. Now, before that, the vid video of him saying that was ever released, um, the, the guys who were doing this um, documentary were sort of hyping it. And so um, they characterized what he said as, they, they, they suggested that he witnessed bodies, or they may have even said that he s said that he saw bodies. And he got upset about that and said, I never said I saw bodies, which is true. He never said he saw bodies. He said, we were stepping over bodies, you can tell when you're stepping over bodies, or something very much like that. It was so dark he couldn't see what was there. It's not clear. I mean, he was told not to look down. You know, so this is a little bit amb amb ambiguous, ambiguous, but in any case, that was the distinction you know, um, that, he, that, that was kind of a cause, or used as a cause for um, feeling um, unfairly treated. Uh, and so anyway, this, they make this documentary on Building 7, and this is right before, um, like a month or so before um, the NIST comes out with their final report, the draft version of the final report. And um, I think it was the draft version. Anyway, um, so in this documentary, they make it seem as though the explosion that Barry Jennings is talking about are caused by the collapse of the buildings. You know, and they do this by um, you know, interviewing him and having him say certain things. And then they interject, the announcers interject the key things about uh, that, that, that nail down that it was um, uh, that the buildings, that it was the buildings collapsing that was causing the explosions. Okay, so that's, that's how they're trying to frame it. But if you go back and look at the, um, at the original interview with Jennings, it's clear that he says, you know, the buildings are still standing after the explosions are going on. Okay? And the, the, the interviewers who, who made this original uh, tape feel kind of burned, you know, at this point. Um, and so they release the, uh, on the internet, they release the videotape of the original interview, where he clearly says, says all this. Um, and then the next thing we know, and about a month or so later, um, Barry Jennings is dead, and then the NIST comes, the NIST comes out with their final report on, on Building 7. And to this day, as far as I know, nobody knows anything really about Barry Jennings' death. It's a mysterious death. We don't know how he died? We don't know how he died. The only thing that we know, is, as far as I know, um, is that he was in the hospital for a couple days, and then he died. Mm -hmm. And other than that, it's, it's quite mysterious. So, I mean, anyway, make of, make of that what you will. <laughs> so, this uh, paper here... Uh, it says, if one wants to get rid of conspiracy theories, it seems one could push in either direction, towards a more <coughs> open society wherein such theories have little plausibility, or in the direction of closed society where such theories are quashed by government and its allies. Um, the, uh, the Harvard professors say that, well, uh, we have an open society, therefore the, uh, the theories are clearly, uh, clearly there could be no conspiracy. But do we really agree that we have an open society? Yeah, the way I would put, you know, a lot of things like this, and people talk in terms of black and white, you know, open society, not open society. <laughs> um, the truth is, with everything, you know, it's a, it's a spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. um, these are matters of degree. There's some degree of openness, and uh, it's not perfectly open. Um, 
And, 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 and I think people can reasonably argue about where exactly we are right now on that spectrum. <clears throat> but it seems clear to me that Sunstein's proposal pushes us in the direction of a more closed society. Yeah. Even though he rhetorically makes gestures towards, um, you know, being in an open society, and the if value. He's going to eliminate the First Amendment. Why? That's pretty close society. Exactly, which right. But the question is, do we have an open society? Uh, we have uh, knowledge-producing institutions which overwhelmingly disagree with uh, uh, the overwhelming opinion of knowledge-producing institutions in the Arab countries or in the Eastern countries. But our universities, they get their, a lot of money from the government for research contracts, yeah. don't they? Yeah. So they're really, uh, all this money coming in from the government. And during the Vietnam War, wasn't there something about if, uh, if a university threw out the ROTC, they lost their government funding? I, I, don't, I, I don't know. It could, could very well be. Mm -hmm. I just don't, you know, well, do you before think, my time. Do you think your university would lose its government funding if it... Uh, as a knowledge producing institution, it came out officially and said uh, uh, the official story of 9-11 was wrong? Well, I know that, that uh, some universities have come under some, some pressure when, when um, faculty members have taken a position on this. Um, Stephen Jones, who was at um, Brigham Young University, was forced into early retirement um, because of a paper which was something like, why indeed did the World Trade Center buildings collapse that he put on his um, faculty website. That was the main reason um, that ultimately an investigation, you know, started, and, and he was, and and it seems that the university, BYU, was under pressure from the vice president's office at that time. Dick Cheney was still vice president. So there's an uh, uh, an example of an open society. Right. We have uh, Brigham Young University, an open uh, knowledge-producing institution. Right. Uh, it relies upon its professors to do the research and produce the knowledge. And so if they produce the wrong knowledge, uh, the, uh, the order comes down from on high to fire them, right? Essentially. And there was somebody in here in um, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. His name is escaping me. Um, professor who came under significant political pressure, um, but he r retained his, his position. Apparently his, the faculty... Uh, supported his right to uh, have an opinion. And another part of an open society is a free press that uh, we're supposedly guaranteed with the First Amendment. But uh, now the press, that would be NBC, CBS, uh, the big newspapers like the New York Times, uh, but they're dependent upon advertising, right? And so the, the big uh, corporations uh, pay for the advertising, which finances the, this open right. free press, supposedly. And the parent companies of the broadcast companies um, are involved in, uh, you know, the military industrial complex, right? And so they profit from um, war, essentially. And so, yes, there's, there's all of these conflicts of interest um, that influence. I mean, you can't, how could you deny that there's significant influence? Um, uh, and especially uh, certain things are just sort of taboo, you know, and you just don't go there um, if you want funding or if you want to um, uh, um, to be elected <laughs> or if you want to, to um, be promoted, you know, especially for like journalists. Um, so yes, yeah, so is that is that an open society? Did you see the recent uh, uh, sixty-minute interview with uh, the founder of WikiLeaks? No, I guess I didn't. Well, uh, they were they were talking. They they did a um, I think it was a half-hour interview with him, and uh, but they uh, told him that he wasn't really. He claims to be part of the free press, protected by the First Amendment. Hmm. But the uh, the interviewer from CBS told him, "Well, you're not really one of us, you know." 
Why? Because he doesn't have credentials. You know, doesn't. I mean, who credentials? Because people? he's not funded with yeah, uh, advertising so. from the big corporations. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is a question. Yeah, like, what makes a person a member of the press? Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to do independent reporting, no, 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 no. You got to be sanctioned. You got to be approved. You got to get a stamp of. I mean, it's it's a, it's that's a little legitimate issue. And that's what these people call an open society. Right. So what else do we have here in the paper? Uh, then uh, it, it talks about uh, these infiltrators. They uh, they can provoke uh, provoke the uh, the infiltrated groups into committing uh, possibly committing crimes, right. and that would justify their arrest. Well, th we have this article here in the um, yeah. the current issue of uh, uh, Mother Jones. Um, called the, um, on page 30, the informants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And something like 500 American citizens have been convicted as a result of infiltrations of these groups. So it's not just, uh, just an academic paper here. This is real. Yes, we're involved in infiltrations and more than just cognitive infiltrations. And that's another thing, you know, that he really abuses history. Thank you. Really abuses history in his, in his dis, uh, depictions of um, like COINTELPRO. Uh, and, and you know, it, it comes off as kind of benign the way he describes it. Um, but it wasn't benign. And this isn't either. You know, and this is still going on. Um, you know, yeah, these are real people that's in jail for 20, 30 years. Um, that's, uh, that's not benign, I would say. No, right. And what's the point of all this? Is that keeping us safe? No, it's what, it's, it has a clear point, though. The point is to, to um, it's propagandistic. It's to um, reinforce an idea in people's minds about uh, terrorism and who terrorists are and how vulnerable we are, um, and how the government is protecting us. Um, you know, that, that case after case after case, we get um, the headlines that the, the government is, has foiled some terrorist plot, and then it turns out, although this doesn't get the same kind of headlines, that, you know, the whole thing was a sting operation. The whole thing was led by a government, they call him an informant. It wasn't an informant, it was somebody was running the, 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 the whole thing. There was, there was no, there'd be no plan, there would be no motivation, there would be no materials to, to carry out um, most of these um, um, supposedly foiled plots if, if they weren't, you know, run from the inside. Mm -hmm. It's um, provocateur. Yeah, these are agent provocateurs that are, the government inserts into the group and they provide the plot and the weapons and... Right. Everything. Yeah, they, um, there's a, a kind of a good episode, it's just it's a little bit dated now, but, um, you know, the show, uh, it's PBS show, Frontline. Uh, it's an episode called um, The Enemy Within. Um, and it's quite relevant to this, this article. Um, uh, they mostly deal with the case in Lodi, California, where an ice cream um, uh, truck salesman um, um, and his son are accused of being terrorists. Um, and um, the son is ultimately convicted and the father is acquitted. They both confessed, but the father's confession was just so absurd that it was, you know, that, it, that, that the jury acquitted. Um, and even the, the son's guilt is really, I think, somewhat in question. Uh, but what was very clear from the, um, from the documentary, and because it was clear because they played the audio, audio recordings of the informant um, who was um, press, pressing and pressing this guy to, to go to a terrorist camp. <clears throat> when he went to, to, I think he went to Pakistan for a wedding or something, and the guy 
talked to him on the phone. He's like, you got to go there. you got to go to the terrorist camp. And he's like, look, I don't, you know, I really just don't want to go. You don't hate, you don't, you know, hate Amer uh, America enough, you know, kind of thing. You know, and just pressing him and pressing him and pressing him, trying to radicalize him. So that's, that's part of it, too. I mean, it's not like these are radicals that, that, that want to do harm, uh, that just don't have the means to do it. You know, they, they're not, you know, first you radicalize them, then you give them the plan, then you give them the materials, you know, and then you drive them there, you know, and then you arrest them. Uh, oh, and you, you know, get them to do something particularly incriminating, also make a video or something. Um, and this just plays out over and over again. And that is the real history of, and it's the history and it's the current reality of infiltration. And there have been 500 cases. Uh, they list the different cases here on, on page uh, 37. And um, over 500 cases like this. Yeah. But we talk about an open, so we're told that we have an open society, which I think we, we agree we, it's not all that open. But we're also told we have a democracy. And um, people thought, well, now we, uh, we elected Obama and uh, Bush is gone, so therefore we, we made a choice uh, right. and something would change. But it turns out the Obama administration has hired uh, this guy who wrote the article uh, advocating infiltration of right. groups, and the Obama administration has increased the war effort. And what is different? Well, I I uh, heard somewhere recently that that Obama received some award for um, transparency in government. Um, but he received that award in secret. <laughs> I, I mean, I think there's some there's truth to that. I don't know the details of it, um, and I don't know you know what the reason was for. Um, I mean, you could say he, re he received it in private, you know, but um, um, but but it, but but it's really rather ironic, you know, that that this this is not a a administration um, that is open. Um, it is an uh, administration that has been really tough, especially on, on whistleblowers, uh, for example, prosecuting them and so on. Bradley Manning is an example. He, uh, he uh, uh, leaked some papers to WikiLeaks, and he's been in, uh, in solitary confinement now for six months. <clears throat> right. I mean, that's his, the, his, the way he's been treated is, is I mean, it's... It's unacceptable, you know. What is that? Yeah, what is that? That's change. We used to have a president called Tricky Dick, and Daniel Ellsberg exposed some of his tricks. Mm -hmm. But Ellsberg never even went to jail. And now uh, Obama is supposed to be a Democrat. Tricky Dick was a Republican. Yeah. But Obama, he doesn't mess around. He puts the guy right in solitary confinement without any trial or anything. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, Ellsberg, I mean, to be fair, I mean, he was lucky to have avoided jail, probably, you know, if circumstances had been a little bit different, um, um, he probably would have gone to jail, but anyway. So what really is American democracy all about? Uh, we, uh, we know about the campaign contributions and that no one can win without campaign contributions. And how much does it cost to run a campaign to, for just for the state senate? It's up in the millions of dollars. To run a campaign for president, you're talking uh, maybe $100 million. So who really controls this? Uh, is, it, is it really uh, Democrats against Republicans, two different ideas? We're going to do something different if the people elect uh, one party as opposed to the other? Or is it the people behind this, the finance? The hundred million dollars for Obama, hundred million dollars for Bush. Uh, in the end, it's the people that write the checks that call the shots, and they write. That's the same people that write the checks for the Democrats, the Republicans, and they call that democracy. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't have a whole lot of wisdom to share on that, but I mean, I I I, I get it. You know, I, I 
and uh, and it's 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 one of the problems. There's many problems. There's there's problems with the electronic voting machines. Um, it's very difficult to to defend the notion that we live in a democracy here in a in a you know any kind of a full sense. Well, Curtis, it's been uh, it's been good having you here, and uh, thank you for coming. Well, thank thank you for inviting me. And for the people at home. Uh, that's, uh, that wraps us up for this month, and uh, I hope you'll tune in again next month for another edition of uh, Vermont Today. Uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>